Sometimes you just see a thing and you can't get it out of your head. That's what today is. This is a paper I saw a little while ago and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. This paper is published in 2011 in Science and titled Ultralight Metallic Microlattices. It's short and sweet and has a pretty cool little protocol to generate these metallic lattice structures using photocurable resin, which then you coat with nickel. This paper caught my eye because it generates these very strong, stiff, and ultra lightweight metal lattice structures using a technology that feels like it's something we could do at home with off-the-shelf components. And that's what we're going to try to do today. The researchers use a special type of photocurable resin, which is not too dissimilar from the type of resin used in SLA resin printers. Expose it to ultraviolet or near ultraviolet light, and you polymerize the resin into a solid. What makes this resin unique is that it forms self-propagating waveguides. Resin used in 3D printers will absorb, polymerize, and then start blocking incident ultraviolet light. And this is important so that you get nice crisp details at the interface between the light and the resin and no further. In contrast, the resin used in this paper will polymerize and then that polymerized resin helps channel more light in the same direction, which causes more polymerization, which causes more channeling and et cetera, et cetera. So it almost forms kind of a fiber optic channel through the resin tank, causing the light to stay in a single self-propagated path. Researchers can take advantage of this property by putting a mask or a waveguide above the tank of resin. And so when collimated light passes through the mask, the pattern is transferred into the tank of resin and you get these lattice structures at whatever granularity the mask decides. This is a neat trick. You can generate really dense or small lattice structures very easily, and it happens much quicker than if you were to 3D print something. So in this paper, they generate the lattice out of the photopolymer, cure it, and then move on to step two, which is the electroless nickel plating process. This is a method of plating items in a thin nickel coating that doesn't use an electrical current like traditional electroplating. So it's an autocatalytic reaction, which once started uniformly covers all available surfaces in a thin coating of nickel phosphorus. The electroless process is pretty nice for two main reasons. One, as I mentioned, it covers all surfaces that are available to the solution in a pretty even coating, which is not something that you can get easily from electroplating, which is much more dependent on the current density at any particular location. So that's a huge advantage, getting a nice even coverage. The second advantage is that you can easily coat non-conductive materials like plastic. After coating their lattice in nickel, they use the final and really nice property of their photoresin, which is that it was dissolvable in a certain solution. In this case, it was three molar sodium hydroxide. After 12 hours of soaking, the polymer dissolves away and you're left with these hollow lattice structures made out of very thin nickel. The walls of the nickel tubes were only about 100 to 150 nanometers thick. Because the structure was hollow, it was very lightweight, and because it was patterned in this lattice structure, it was also very stiff. I have a resin 3D printer, which I'll be using for this project, but I don't have electroless nickel plating solution. You can buy this commercially, it's actually not too expensive, but it is designed for plating other metals because the metal starts the catalytic reaction. So I'm going to be trying traditional electroplating, which means I need to make the plastic conductive to accept a copper base coat. There's a ton of material on the internet about how to get started with electroplating, and I grabbed the most common method of making plastic conductive, which is making up a conductive paint using graphite. It's essentially a little bit of black acrylic paint to act as the binder, some water to thin it down, and then graphite to make it conductive. My graphite is specifically made to be extra conductive, and it has particles under 10 microns in size. It worked well, but I wasn't really happy with the thickness of the paint, and I feared that it would be difficult to get an even coating across these lattice structures that I'm going to print. Ultimately, I ended up working out a sort of conductive ink, which I tried a few different recipes, but settled on a mix of isopropyl alcohol, the graphite, a splash of the acrylic paint to act as the binder, 
And then importantly, a little bit of a wetting agent to keep the graphite in suspension longer. And so I used a little bit of tween 20 because that's what I had on hand. The graphite still likes to settle out. So I found that tossing the ink in the ultrasonic cleaner for 20 or 30 minutes really helped break up the particle agglomerations and get everything back into suspension. The original plan was to airbrush this ink across the prints, but I found just dipping it in the ink worked much better. The goal is to plate these prints with nickel, but nickel doesn't really like to plate onto graphite, and I did test it to verify that. So the standard way to get to the nickel step is to first plate with a copper base plate. This is a fairly standard sulfuric acid copper sulfate bath. There's nothing too fancy about this. And the process is pretty easy, to be honest. You connect the positive side of the power supply to some electrodes, and you connect the negative to the part you want to plate, immerse it in the solution, and keep an eye on the current. A current-controlled power source is definitely ideal here because you're mostly interested in the current density of the part, not the voltage. And so you want to start relatively low. I started 60 to 100 milliamps to let the copper kind of slowly work its way out across the graphite. And once you get more coating, you can increase the current. More current means more faster generally, but if you go too fast, you start forming bubbles, which leads to bad plating, or you can burn out the graphite in places and not get any plating at all. So you want to take it kind of slow to start. After the copper comes the nickel plating process, and it's basically the same. Rinse in distilled water, dip in a quick acid etch to clean off the copper, rinse again with water, and throw it in the nickel plating solution. This is a commercially available bright nickel plating, so it won't give a very thick deposit, and I'm not entirely sure of the contents, but there's a lot of recipes for nickel plating solutions out there as well. The nickel plating goes a lot faster because the surface of the part has already been coated in a nice conductive copper, and so you can leave these in the nickel. If all goes well, you should have a nicely plated resin print. And these prints are just really cool. Like in your hand, they feel very light, like a plastic part, but they have that kind of metallic stiff feel to them. And they just feel really strong when you put pressure on them. Personally, I'm super curious to see what kind of mechanical properties we can get out of these plated prints. I've already printed up a bunch of test samples that I'll be coating in different types of baths. And we'll see if we can plot out some stress strain curves. So subscribe, follow along, and watch this space for more stuff in the future. In the paper, they had the luxury of being able to dissolve their resin. And trust me, I tried. You really can't dissolve commercial off-the-shelf resins at all. I was expecting that and figured, hey, I'll just burn it out. I have a furnace, and we can get it up to the point where the resin decomposes, burns out, and you're left with a hollow tube. Easy. As it turns out, not quite as easy as I had hoped. You can, in fact, burn it out, and that part goes pretty straightforward. What I didn't think about is that Thermoset resins, so resins like the UV cure resins, expand when they decompose. This isn't normally an issue when doing investment casting because you're working with waxes or thermoplastics like PLA, which first melt out of the cavity, and then when they start decomposing and volatilizing, they don't expand dramatically, and so you don't have issues. But the thermoset rapidly decomposes, releases a huge amount of gas, and the pressure can cause problems. For these thin lattice walls, you can see where the pressure ruptured a whole bunch of the tubes all around the lattice. A quick skim of the literature, and I found that this is an expected phenomenon. It's been documented in papers, so oops. I tried some variations, but just never really could get my resin printer to work, so I had to fall back to my FDM printer. It's not very well tuned. It really struggles with sparse lattices, although it can do a dense lattice okay-ish. But it was worth a shot, and PLA does do pretty well with investment casting. So I printed up a bunch of different samples, some sparse lattices, some really dense lattices, some TPMS, which are triply periodic minimal surfaces like gyroids and diamond sheets. And all these lattices were generated with NTOP software, which I'm definitely going to talk about in the future because it is some cool, cool software. I ran through the exact same procedure as the resin printers as far as electroplating is concerned, burned them out with a similar burnout schedule, and got some mixed results. So the dense lattices printed out relatively well on my untuned printer, and the burnout schedule worked perfectly. I had no issues with it blowing out the walls. The issue is really with the plating. 
These dense lattices are basically an electroplating's worst nightmare. All of the external regions of the lattice are much closer to the anode and have much higher current density than the interior portions of the lattice. And because it's so dense, it's hard to get electrolyte flowing through the center. So what you end up getting is a good plating on the external surfaces and relatively weak or no plating on the internal surfaces. I knew this was gonna be an issue, but I was curious to see just how bad of an issue. And as it turns out, it's pretty significant. The internal really didn't plate much at all. If I were to ever get electroless nickel plating, this really wouldn't be a problem. And this is the reason why the researchers used it to begin with, because you get nice even coverage on the interior surfaces of these dense lattices. So this is a fixable problem if you wanted to pursue that route and it wouldn't be too difficult. Yep, not much going on in there. Some of this is carbon from the graphite that held up in small, very fragile tubes, and a lot of it's just empty space. Ignoring the sparse lattice monstrosity in the back, the two TPMS samples in the front actually printed out and burned out pretty nicely. These are both diamond sheet TPMS, and I chose them specifically because you can get a pretty open structure and have long, continuous tracks that a FDM printer does an okay job with. So there's not a lot of retractions like you would have on a lattice. The first sample was copper-only coating, because I was curious to see how it would do without a nickel overcoat. Uh, it's dark black, partially from carbon soot that builds up, and partially because the copper just oxidizes to a dark color. It cleans up if you drop it in some vinegar and salt. The second sample is nickel-plated like everything else we've seen so far. These worked much better than the dense lattices. You can see the interior plated really nicely, even though it is pretty far inside of the, the structure and it burned out really nicely as well. There's no explosion marks anywhere. Both samples saw a mass reduction of about 65 to 70%. And when you section a small piece of these and look at how thick the plating is, it looks like it's about 60 microns on average, depending on where you look. 40 to 50 microns of that is probably the copper, and about 10 microns is the nickel, although it's hard to tell because I didn't have anything to preferentially etch or color one metal versus the other. So it's a little tricky to see in the microscope. All in all, I'm pretty jazzed by these results. It's not quite a pure replication of the paper. You know, it's different techniques and the results are a little different. They're a little stiffer than the paper because the wall thicknesses are notably thicker 60 microns as opposed to 10 or so microns. But I think this holds a lot of promise with a better printer and a little more careful preparation of the plating. I think you could probably get pretty close to the paper, which is uh, pretty neat in my opinion. I'm also excited to experiment a little bit more with this plating process. I think there's a lot of potential here to make really functional 3D prints by coating it in various types of plating. As I mentioned, there's different types of copper plating, different types of nickel plating. And you can also do ferrous or iron plating, which seems really cool as well. So I think I'm going to spend some time testing out the material properties of these and we'll see how it goes. Thanks for watching.